Good evening. Good evening, everyone. If you can take a seat, you don't need to go in. We've got a lot of stuff to cover tonight. Really glad to see so many folks here. I'm seeing, uh, my name's Katie Rice. I'm the county supervisor for District 2, most of the Ross, all the Ross Valley, pretty much, and then over the hill to San Rafael. Um, I'm here to welcome you here tonight, and then I'm going to hand off promptly to our project manager, Dan Dawson, from the county. There will be a presentation, um, time for questions. This is the third community workshop we've had on the Sir Francis Drake project. In between, there's been um, on-site uh, meetings out in the field with neighbors and residents, walking uh, stretches of Sir Francis Drake, getting input. There's been, there's a uh, technical advisory committee made up of public works directors, of uh, facilities people from the schools, of people who understand engineering. There's a community advisory committee that's made up of representatives from Greenberg Property Owners Association, Bonnier Shopping Center, uh, CSA 16, other community groups. So there's been a, a lot of, a lot of process up to date. Uh, on this project, but actually we're still in the design phase. So we have much more process to go and to have so many people engaged and learning about this is really important. I think the better we can do this public process, the better product we're going to have in the end and something I hope will um, really benefit the community and the community can get behind. So um, with that, I encourage everyone to um, really tune your ears into this presentation. Um, have your questions ready. I think that probably the team's going to try to, instead of taking questions all the way through, you know, go, go through some of the presentation and then take questions in bunches so that we try to get through all the material. And then do stay to provide comment in the workshop portion, which will follow the uh, presentation questions. So again, thank you for coming. And uh, I'm going to hand off to Dan Dawson. Two levels. And they can adapt changing traffic conditions over the course of the day. Um, the consistent one that you're talking about, that we're looking at to go all out on would be $4 to $5 million. On the, the $4 to $5 million. And the after control really requires quite a, a maintenance commitment and operations commitment. So we think it would help and will help down the lines. We want to set the groundwork so that the conduits and everything are there in place to allow it to occur because you need, need to do some more work down the line with, with the state. Obviously, at the interchange. Um, in the meantime, we will say that part of the project, we, it is time to start looking at retiming the lights anyway. They have been retired for five to six years. So that be, that'd be done as part of the project with and in conjunction with the intersection improvements. Just to clarify, you said four to five million dollars, and we have a total budget of 13 million dollars, six of which are <coughs> used for road rehabilitation. So there are uh, options that you have available to you in terms of priorities that are assigned to how that extra six million dollars that came up would be utilized. And the concern that I have is that we do have opportunities within the budget, potentially at least, to adopt a progressive, forward-looking, uh, technology-oriented strategy that in fact I think at all times of the day would have a material benefit on congestion problems. Um, and the question is why aren't we giving that a higher priority in the budget? a little 
little technical glitch here. Um, so just to just to go back about a little bit about how the funds were allocated, we thought a lot about um, what all these different project types, how they affect and how they can potentially relieve congestion. So as you can see in the graph right here, the pavement repair and options that actually will reduce congestion along the corridor occupy more than 50% of the overall project budget. Uh, in this, it's about, it represents about $9 million. The other portions of it basically are allocated to things like pedestrian facilities, and they could be like Ash Avenue or McAllister. Uh, the multi-use facility, you can see, is a large uh, $4 million. It's a very large portion of that pie. Um, and it, of course, is because there's a lot of work that goes into it. But when we look at all the different options that we've allocated and looked at right here, a large percentage of the $18 million, over $9 million of that is actually allocated to things that will help reduce congestion along the corridor. Kevin, just to answer the question on the measure A that was passed, adopted by the voters in 2005, it actually had four components, and I may not get the percentages correct here. A um, uh, portion of it uh, was 25%, maybe more, for uh, transit, public transit. Uh, another 25% or so was for um, closing the 101 carpool lane, it's called the Gap Closure Project. A portion of Measure A funds were de are dedicated to safe routes to schools and safe pathways programs, and then a portion of the funding actually goes back to local jurisdictions, including the County of Marin, for local road improvement projects. And I went back and read the um, actual original uh, project authorization through Measure or through TAM, and this is very consistent. And when the money's been allocated, it requires, the language in there requires that the project be consistent with Measure A. So um, I can verify that the project is consistent. But I think we want some more questions on also the, the project, what's, being, what's, being, what's been presented to you, so that one, we can clarify any information, and then also so that there's time to go back and you can share your opinions about some of what's being proposed. I just had a clarifying question about speed. It sounds like you all are trying to reduce the speed along the corner there. We're trying to encourage a consistent speed and something that would be more reflective of the posted speed limit. I don't think there's necessarily an intent that everybody is going to be going slow. Traffic calming was used. I think that this is just more about following the posted speed limit. And in you know, the specific example of lane widths, 11 foot lane is a very standard lane for this posted speed limit and higher. Uh, freeway lanes, 11 and 12 feet. So this is very consistent with that. I don't think there's anything too, too unusual in that in terms of lane widths. Question here. I'm still concerned about the bike lanes, which you're now calling shoulders that people will ride their bikes on, on a <laughs> section of College Ave from, I'm sorry, a section of Kansas Street from College Ave to Basage. Um, if they aren't properly marked as bike lanes, will motorists give bikes enough consideration? I mean, I keep thinking of little kids riding their bikes, and now they're on unmarked bike lanes. How safe is that? So I think they're not going to be marked as bike lanes, and there will not be uh, there will not be a class two or a standard bike lane on on, on the street. Um, so I, as a parent, would encourage my children to to ride their bikes there. Kids of a, a under twelve are able to ride their bikes on a sidewalk, and we have locations where we want those sidewalks to be able to accommodate a child that's going to school. And, um, so I think that's really that's really the the approach. The approach is that those are not bicycle lanes, and so kids wouldn't necessarily be riding their bikes there. Now we recognize that there are cyclists that use Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. Uh, the vehicle code allows a cyclist to ride in a lane of, of traffic. That's certainly to their own peril uh, in this instance. 
Um, and so there are places where these shoulders would have some benefit to those cyclists that don't want to ride in the center of the lane. And I don't think that many of, of us drivers would want them to be riding at 10 miles an hour in the center of the lane either. So these shoulders do provide some of those benefits. Um, you know, they're really occurring along this section between college, uh, near Ash and Terrace, where there's perhaps there might be some local bicycle access. But again, we don't have enough width unless we were to take out a travel lane or do some of these other measures, we don't have the width to provide those, uh, those bicycle facilities, and so we're unable to do that. I have a uh, question about the width. There are natural choke points, I think the top of, across the street from the bar near, that the T is a choke point, do you agree? A narrowing where you just can't go anywhere because of the private property. That's a choke point. On the sidewalk. All right. Now, I haven't gone to any meetings yet, and I just wonder, have you addressed getting more property by going to the private owners on the margins that you could use for an area and offer them a sound wall by taking their property, paying them, but giving them a sound wall that would give them a lot less noise from the street level. And the sound wall would be bouncing the sound to non-residential areas like basic school or Catholic. Thank you. We haven't explored sound walls uh, we have certainly looked at could we, if we had a few more feet, what could we do with that? Um, but the cost of acquisition of that property is extremely high. Um, this is already a, you know, a, a, we have a lot of folks here in the room that are, don't necessarily, aren't here because we're taking property. So property acquisition has really been taken off of the table. That's just not one of our options. We gotta work within our means of budget. We gotta work within our right of way as well. So that's, that's how I would, how would characterize our approach? Uh, my, my question is about the um, process from here. Um, I'm assuming that the Board of Supervisors are going to vote up or down on this uh, proposal, um, not through the consent calendar. And if so, uh, is there going to be an opportunity for formal public comment uh, and a, uh, a public hearing? Uh, and uh, my related question is, uh, what has been done in the way of uh, formal outreach to other jurisdictions that will be affected by a lengthy construction project? And there obviously has been a lot of traffic that detours to Magnolia and Miracle Mile and Doherty and Trammell Pius. Um, and I would assume that those people would like to have a public hearing process as well. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Uh, these are certainly uh, very public. Um, as the project goes through CEQA, that comes with its own series of very public hearings and noticed hearings and noticed comments. I can't speak for the supervisor's uh, review schedule, but I, I have somebody to thank. So there will, um, the money, uh, the next phase of this, to, to send it into the environmental review, will require an allocation of funding. And the Board of Supervisors will have, the TAM Board, I believe, will have to trigger it first, and then it will come through the Board of Supervisors. So there's a couple opportunities there. And then with regards to I, the you know, construction management and that phase, and that also, uh, a lot of the, that construction management and trying to mitigate construction impacts will also is addressed through CEQA. So there's plenty of public hearings there. And then um, I, I will, assuming it will happen, and if it's not, I will make it happen. Um, I have been asking this team to work really closely with our neighboring jurisdictions on this corridor project, even though it is uh, the project confines are within the unincorporated town of Marin, because it's a corridor that is serving traffic that moves from county unincorporated into Larkspur, et cetera. So when we get to construction mitigation and looking at traffic impacts of construction, that, that'll be part of the process. So all I can say is many public hearings, and um, I think it's really incumbent upon any local jurisdiction when they're doing projects of this kind to impact other jurisdictions to include them in that discussion. Thank you. Both the
the city of Larkspur and town of Ross um, have both been uh, participating as part of our technical advisory committee, so they have very much been engaged with the process to date. And uh, as have, for example, Caltrans, which obviously there would be potentially be impacts to one on one as well. So they're one of many partners that have been participating in the, in the program here. I got, a, I got a couple of hands. Okay, I'm going to go here. I'm going to work my way to the third person who's in the last row. I have a simple question. I wonder whether or not y'all have considered putting a median barrier from Elysio to the freeway going east to keep people from diving in at the end, which slows down the traffic trying to get on the freeway. I mean, you're in the right lane, and everybody runs up and then dives in, which really does slow it down, blocks the box and everything else. And my other question is, doesn't the county have some of our own engineers? You guys are all great, but it seems like we do everything by paying for consulting. that we want to take in to, uh, into consideration. Um, that bugs the heck out of me when cars are cutting in at the end. And, and uh, you have a, a great photo there as a great example of these kinds of bollards, you know, these sorts of flexible posts that might like see at the toll plazas, uh, just keeping cars from cutting in at the last minute. So, so noted. As far as the consultants go, <laughs> You give them a conflict of interest answer. Um, the, the, the idea is we use staff for projects when we have the expertise on staff and they have the time to do the project. So a project like this, we do have traffic engineers that do similar work to what Dave Parisi does. They, we have uh, maybe one or two. They are busy working on smaller intersection improvements and all the myriad of little public works traffic engineering projects that come our way on a daily basis. It was determined that we didn't have the capacity, one element being traffic engineering, to handle this project. So that's why David Parisi was brought on board. It doesn't make sense, uh, in, my, in my viewpoint, and I think my colleagues agree, to, to bring on consultants to do pro to, to, to use staff or to hire extra staff and make them permanent to do a project that is finite and has its own dedicated funding. But it will be done, and that means we don't, as wonderful as all these people are, and they actually done, I think, a fantastic job, they're not going, on, we're not having to pay them a pension when this project is done. So, so I think it was, it was, it was the right idea. You guys have great staff, and it's been an honor to work with all of them. Um, at the, the bus stop on the north side of Francis Drake at College of Marin, is that going to be moved? That was, it was addressed on the walk around, it was definitely going to be moved. I have heard everything today about it. Yes, it is. Uh, this is a project that's been <coughs> ongoing with the College of Marin and the Transit District. This would move the bus stop from its current location closer to the fire station, closer to the signal at Elm, basically where the parking lot is for the college on the north side of the roadway. And one of the things for that is that's a situation where some additional right of way would help to fit some of those facilities in, and the college has been willing to provide that right of way. So that's been a help to move that along. It's a great example of one of those uh, points that's displayed on the uh, on the boards back here, but we kept things moving up on the front of the room. Here we go. Thanks so much for being so patient. Thank you very much. I recognize um, that you've put in a lot of work since the last meeting, and I really appreciate this. I began to think that sometimes the parameters you're given are not necessarily the ideal parameters to find the best solution possible. In other words, if we were able to expand the dialogue with the peripheral towns such as Larkspur, Ross, San Anselmo, because we all know Sir Francis Drake Boulevard is the key road to uh, Marin General Hospital and to 101. It is the key road for all emergency vehicles, fire ambulances, and so forth. So if you could look at and work with the other jurisdictions and say, well, if we could put our, our faster traffic on Sir Francis Drake, could we then go to Magnolia and College and Kent Avenue 
and Shady Lane and San Anselmo Avenue and put our more pedestrian bicycle users there and have a more larger cooperative effort and they could, we would have a more comprehensive plan that then would be able to fit with, um, they could do it at their time, the county could do it on their schedule, but at least then we would know that there was a really good plan in place for everyone. Uh, and we weren't bumping into the shoulders of everybody. And, and I feel like you've just been working with the parameters you were given. But maybe we should look a little bit beyond to find the best solution possible. Maria, thank you. We certainly have been coordinating with Larkspur, uh, with Ross, as, as Dan said. There's, there's always more. you got to think regionally. Thanks for the comments. Thomas, what's your name? <laughs> yes, um, I've been listening a lot of what you're doing is actually um, making things a little bit more dangerous in order to slow them down. So you tighten a corner so people will go around it so fast. Okay, they're not going around it so fast because they can't see as well, which in a way is more dangerous. So for everything that you do here, like narrowing the lanes, there's a tremendous amount of truck traffic that goes up and down these lanes. Trucks trying to maneuver when the drivers are frustrated and annoyed. And less room to do it is inherently more dangerous. 11 feet may be just fine, but it may not be just fine with kids running around because we have a huge amount of children on this road. Um, if you take two lanes and try to put them through the flood area onto 101 South, I think I heard that, to me, that is a dangerous thing because now you have more traffic trying to spurt onto the highway. And that may be just fine if all the traffic in San Rafael is stopped because of the smart train. But if it isn't, it will be dangerous. <laughs> and I hope, I did not hear you say that you are allowing people 10 seconds to walk those long intersections because that's just really not reasonable. Some of us don't sprint that well. Thanks, Thanks for the comments. I think we didn't give any timing. Uh, thank you. Uh, Frank Ager from Fairfax. And I, I come down to Sebastian Street Quarter about three times a week for my, for my day job. And I service uh, some of the stores here in, in the Ross Valley. A number of us in the upper Ross Valley are using the Miracle Mile to go through Santa Fe to get the one on to go south of because of the congestion down here. And uh, you mentioned the 11 foot lanes, and there's a problem with 11 foot lanes. A big rig or a bus or even one of our fire engines are eight feet wide, and you put a, a foot and a half bear on each side, and you've got 11 feet right there. They're taking up that whole 11 foot lane. So I think you have to have at least a one lane large enough to handle a, a big rig or, or a large bus. Um, until such time as we can, as we can uh, affect the change on, on the access to 101 to either go under, under Highway 101 or, or southbound 101. Get two lanes in each direction. We're really not going to get a lot of relief here in the lower, in the, in the lower Ross Valley. Then that's the bottom line. It, 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 and the state needs to, needs to get us two lanes going southbound and two lanes going, uh, in effect, northbound on the freeway. And are they, uh, how, how far off is something like that? So a question related to the, to the freeway, the Caltrans project uh, went its course and it hasn't been revived. I can't speak to uh, any future timing. David, you, your crystal ball say um, when Caltrans might be with them? <laughs> no. <laughs> there, was, there was an effort a few years ago, again called the Rebreak study, that um, evolved a lot of dialogue. Part of the solution one of the components of the project was to provide that two-lane on-ramp. Uh, of course, what was configured at the time would have created a braking situation with some elevation changes over by the uh, wind cup site. Uh, there's a lot of opposition to that. So that project, uh, it's not even on hold, it's just gone now. So, um, yeah, so that, that's, not, uh, that's not on the table. But you're right, um, during the peak of the peak, even providing the two lanes coming to the south on, uh, on ramp, there still will be traffic. The benefit of the added third lane would be during the other 22 hours of the day. 
particularly for El Portal, Portal, La Cuesta, and Licio intersections. So we're trying to find, uh, to squeeze out as much capacity and congestion relief as we can for as long as we can. Oh yeah, the 11 foot lanes, I know it's come up several times. Um, you know, if you think about, um, from a traffic perspective, 11 foot lanes can accommodate any fire apparatus, buses, semi-trailers, and cars. It is a standard lane dimension that is used in 2016 and has been used for the last decade. So we're very comfortable with that. And there was a comment about right turns and uh, some of the uh, turn radii reductions that we're looking at. Those will all be accommodated for fire apparatus, semi-trailers, uh, buses, and the intent is to increase sight lines by providing those and slow down some of the movements. Keep in mind, we're not taking away right turn lanes. The right turn lanes will still stay there. People can get off into a right turn lane and then make that right turn so, there's, so that it's much safer for pedestrians. At all intersections? At any of the intersections that have right turn lanes. But theoretically, it slows it down because right now you sure. can- Sure, it's a good thing. So, so here on the one, one thing about the right turn lanes um, and right turns. Right turns are a minority of the traffic going through the intersections. And they get as much green time. And sometimes they have more opportunity to turn right than the through traffic because not only do they get the green light, they often can turn right on red. So there's plenty of capacity for the turns to be made. It's a, it is a trade-off. We want is it the trade-off from cars moving fast, turning fast through an intersection where kids, when they're supposed to yield to kids crossing, versus slowing down. And we, we are confident I that looking at all the traffic volumes, you know, safety, there won't be any backups. Safety is critical, but I haven't heard of any accidents involving pedestrians at those intersections. We, there, there, there's been plenty. We've looked at all the collisions uh, up and down this corridor. So again, from a safe routes perspective, but just even a pedestrian perspective, we want to we want to provide a safer, safer environment. Just going to do a little time check. I said we were going to do 15 minutes. We're now pushing 20. So I'm going to try, I'm going to cut us off here in just a couple minutes. I'm going to do three three more questions. I see uh, one here. I see one here, and I see one there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm a Greenboro resident. I grew up in Kenfield, <clears throat> so I have 50 years of institutional knowledge to this problem. Um, I think it would be, I think most people in this room would agree that the traffic has gotten worse since we closed the Greenbrae School. And when you're trying to come up with solutions, if you find the causes, usually a pretty smart way to go about it. Have we looked at how many cars we might be able to get off the road by providing a good old fashioned yellow bus system to Greenbrae? And how much that might cost? And I would also guess that that might be safer than kids crossing the street. So it could actually serve both purposes. My second question is in regard to the quagmire of getting on the Richmond Bridge. Um, <clears throat> I think that there are a lot of people that use Moran as a thoroughfare. A lot of Northeast Bay commuters that travel through Moran because it's free. Has anybody looked at changing the toll so that you have to pay going that way? And I'll bet you that would be a lot cheaper than a lot of other solutions. Thank you.
like any repaving street project, you know, you can't have a car and a repaving truck on the same lane. Um, we haven't gotten into what that's going to look like, uh, hours of operation, how many lanes would remain open. Those are all details to be sorted out. Um, but clearly, the amount of attention we're paying towards traffic capacity now in the ultimate is also going to be a factor as we're looking at construction sequences. Right, right. Traffic will remain on Sir Francis Drake. And that's often an issue. You know, residential neighborhoods don't want to be inundated with uh, with other traffic and things. So. This question is for David. My name is Kevin Murphy. Uh, I'm a local resident. I walked over here. I live between Basic and Kent Schools. We have for uh, about 29 years. Um, I'm concerned about one particular slide. If you can pull up the slide that shows the McAllister Avenue uh, intersection. That one. OK. Um, if you look at the east, the west end, you see the enlarged sidewalk there. And you're putting the McAllister traffic uh, that's leaving the neighborhood onto Sir Francis Drake, and it's just two lanes, and you're giving us a left turn left turning lane, um, you're, sorry, you're giving us a, a receding lane on uh, Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, but you're making it necessary for one car that's in that position to block all the other traffic that wants to maybe turn right. Remember, we are in this neighborhood. We only have two ways to get onto Sir Francis Drake, and that is a very major, very important inter intersection. So I want you to tell us about how the right turning, this is, here we go. The people going eastbound on Sir Francis Drake that are turning onto McAllister are going to have to slow nearly to a stop, make a hard right turn, which would be different than the slip lane type of intersection we have now. And a lot of people take their kids to school that way, to go to Basage, or to drop them off at the Stadium Way Bridge to get into Kent back door. Looks to me like this is destined to slow traffic on Sir Francis Drake Boulevard all the way back into Ross. And I'm not sure this is an ideal solution. Can you address that, please? Sure, that's a great question. We've been working really closely with this uh, community and city across the school for, the, for access and um, to address some of the problems at this intersection. What's happening today, as John mentioned, is that eastbound traffic can really whip into that, into McAllister. There's even a sign out there, if you look, it's been there for years, it says slow to 25 miles an hour. There's been a speeding problem with people coming into the street. So what we're looking at is extending the curb out. Dr eastbound drivers that want to take a right turn, there'll still be room for them to get out of the three lanes into a right turn lane, into the shoulder, to make the right turn without affecting eastbound traffic. Um, the other comment about traffic coming out of McAllister, that's, very, that's, that's also a great comment. We, um, we need to modify this diagram to provide room for left turns and right turns. So a right turning car that's going eastbound of Drake can get by that left turning car. So if you see things like that tonight, let us know. We're already aware of that, and we're going to adjust this to provide turning lanes in both in both directions. Does that help? Does that answer the question? Yeah, I'm not convinced that what you're telling us addresses the impact of making a right turn from Sir Francis Drake onto McAllister. I understand your goal of slowing it down. And I'm not sure all of us have the same Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, there, there are those who are going to be turning right on Sir, onto McAllister, but many people are going to be continuing on on Sir Francis Drake, so a few cars turning right will congest everybody back to Fairfax. Again, what I'm, I should have uh, explained earlier, if there's a, a pointer, somebody could point for me. And this is, this is an excellent feedback, too, because we could, if necessary, even provide a right turn pocket with right turn you know, arrows within that area, because there's enough pavement to do it, right? We'll just have to see if it affects parking. But I see what you say. We want to definitely look at the goal of this project. One of the main goals is to reduce congestion for through traffic in both directions on, on Sir Francis Drake. So if you see things like that, it's the feedback we want to know. I would say that's the process at work. So thanks for that insight. And that's the kind of change and interpretation that, that we make in order to make it work that much better. And we're really at that point now. I think we've gotten a lot of big things um, kind of understood. And now we're making a lot of those little tweaks and those little things that make it work better for you as a resident, uh, make it work better for our kids uh, as pedestrians. 
But with that, we have about a half an hour left in our evening. We're cutting our time a little bit short. We want you to engage us at these stations. I'm gonna make a couple points before you start moving, hang on. We have two equal walls. So this 